So I'm sure you know by now that the world hasn't always looked the way it does today, not just in terms of life, but in terms of geography. Now one drastic and relatively recent change has been in the land of the free. I oh, know, now I've done that joke. Now during the late Cretaceous, the United States wasn't just a single country, it was two. Now the actual bedrock that made up the continental crust was practically no different, but what was different was the sea level. They'd risen to such a point that a warm shallow sea went straight through the middle of North America, splitting it in two. This sea is known as the Western Interior Seaway, and it had arguably the most ecological significance of the continent at this time, as well as on the science of paleontology itself. So let's get into why. So what really is it? The warm shallow sea that was the Western Interior Seaway ran down from the Arctic Ocean all the way down to the Gulf of Mexico with the western coast running down through Montana, Wyoming, Utah, New Mexico and all the way through Mexico with the country of Laramidia to the west and the eastern coast running through Minnesota, South Dakota, Nebraska, Kansas and curving round through Oklahoma, cutting through Alabama, Georgia and South Carolina making the eastern country of Appalachia. Now it's really important to note that even though these were two separate land masses, they were not two separate cratons. In other words, it was all the same lump of continental crust, and if you reduced the sea level, it wouldn't have looked hugely different to North America today. So why was there a giant sea? Well, it's a mixture of factors that resulted in this. During the Jurassic and Cretaceous, there was a myriad of mountain building events that created mountain belts both on land and in the middle of the oceans. On land, the mountains would have caused the surrounding land to depress slightly, much like when you sit in the middle of a trampoline, meaning that the middle of the US was a lot more low-lying and the mountains being created under the sea would have displaced the water, much like dropping something solid in a glass of water. Not only this, but the Mesozoic greenhouse had been causing sea level rises for long periods until and through this time. Land sinking and water rising gives you very vast, inland seas. Now this inland sea was unlike any other before or afterwards, but one thing it did have in common was the presence of life. So let's take a look at the fossils that have been found from this area. Now I'm going to be going into a lot of the organisms in a lot more detail in the coming weeks, but if you feel you can't wait that long then I do have a Patreon link down below where one of the benefits you can get is early access to my videos, so be sure to check that out. Now as with all bodies of water, the majority of life here was invertebrates. You had your usual suspects such as mollusks, including giants like Enoceramus, as well as ammonites and belemnites, but not much in terms of corals have actually been found here. Now, this is because corals are quite fussy with their temperature and salt content requirements. And it's been found that the Western Interior Seaway was not only very warm, but also had strangely low salinity for a sea. Then you had the fish. This sea was teeming with the things, including small to medium sized ray finned fish, as well as absolutely massive famous monsters like Cephactinus, a predatory fish with trapdoor jaws lined with sharp teeth that grew to the size of 5 to 6 meters or 16 to 20 feet the body, not the teeth. There were also cartilaginous fish such as Squalicorax, Cretozorina, and sharks that specialized in crushing shells such as Tychodus. Sharks in particular have been known to munch on some of the terrestrial animals here as well, whether it be scavenging dinosaurs that washed out to sea, or possibly predating on the pterosaurs that were fishing here. Then you had the dominators of the Mesozoic, the reptiles. The Western Interior Seaway has yielded a lot of famous names with regards to reptiles, including a plethora of plesiosaurs like the famous Elasmosaurus, Mosasaurus such as Plotosaurus, the very large Tylosaurus, and another shell country and critter, Globidens. You also had the poster boy of giant turtles, Archelon, and the second largest, Protostega with the former measuring in around 4 to 5 metres or 13 to 16 feet in length. Crocodiles have also been found in the seaway having lived on both sides of the coasts. 
likely within the rivers that led out to the seaway before their remains were washed out there. One celebrity name you may have heard that was first discovered here is a relative of today's alligators and is a contender for the biggest croc to ever live, Dinosuchus, which could have reached up to nearly 11 meters or 36 feet long. The seaway even served as home to some semi-aquatic dinosaurs, namely birds, such as Hesperonis. Now you might think it's weird that I am moving on to more terrestrial animals when I'm discussing a shallow sea, but a huge amount of land animals have been found from these rocks. Almost as many as the actual land rocks themselves. We'll get onto why in just a sec. Various ornithopods and ankylosaurs have been found to have floated out to sea. The latter of which have especially shown their preservation potential, since the posthumous gases produced and the weight of the back armour meant that ankylosaurs would float and eventually sink upside down, preserving the back especially well when it becomes buried. Named from the Western Interior Seaway is also what is arguably the most famous pterosaur, Pteranodon longiceps. Now again, pterosaur fossils are excessively common here due to the fact that many of them could be seen soaring above the seaway along with the smaller seabirds like Ichthyornis, fishing for food or even possibly crossing the seaway altogether. So how the hell does a marine environment preserve things so well that even terrestrial animals are found almost as commonly as they are found in terrestrial rocks? Well, it's a number of factors. First, the sea is being fed organisms from both sides, as well as what is above and below the surface. On top of this, the unique conditions meant preservation was a lot easier. You see, despite being shallow, the bottom of this sea was quite anoxic, meaning that there was little to no oxygen in the waters. Because of this, there wasn't a lot living down there, even on a microscopic scale. So anything that sunk to the bottom was left alone by scavengers and decomposing organisms that feed on dead material were limited to those that can handle anoxic conditions. So things even decomposed a lot slower down there. With things being as calm as they are, these remains were gently buried in sediment, partly provided by coccolithophores, a type of microscopic organism that, when fossilised, create chalk. With chalk being as finely grained as it is, this also means that exquisite detail can be captured on the critters that already had great chances of being preserved. Now the Western Interior Seaway had a lot of impact during its time of existence, but it also had vast impacts after it was gone. The science of paleontology has been pushed all the further thanks to paleontologists cutting their teeth studying these rich beds for nearly 150 years, capturing and pulling in information about an entire continent for the Lake Cretaceous. Not only this, but it's also thought that the Western Interior Seaway has had some effects on modern American politics. Now, if you were to pull up a map of the US that shows the voting majority for most modern elections, the predominantly red Republican states towards the southeast appear to have a belt of Democratic blue across it. It just so happens that this roughly lines up with where the coast of the Western Interior Seaway was in those states. Now the sediment that was being laid down here at the time just so happened to be very fertile rich soils, of which plenty of cotton plants were known to grow. Now we all know that during times of American slavery, African slaves were used to pick these cotton fields. But once slavery was abolished and they found themselves free, many chose to stay and make a life for themselves there. Descendants are still there to this day and a correlation has been noted between Democratic voters and African Americans. So a sea that picked up dinosaurs and pterosaurs is potentially still affecting politics to this day. Now, nothing lasts forever, and spoiler alert, the US is not covered in sea anymore. Sea levels eventually shrank again as temperatures cooled long after the KPG mass extinction, and by the end of the Paleocene, around 56 million years ago, the Western Interior Seaway had faded out of existence, leaving behind its gifts for us paleo nerds. Now I hope you guys enjoyed this quick one and if you did be sure to leave a like and let me know down in the comments and I will catch you guys next time.